All right, we are back. I hope that you guys enjoyed the Dirty Mind DIY screening and the live commentary by an amazing panel, but we are not finished. And I am super excited what? to bring Andre back to the stage, but with one of my favorite people yeah, on. It should have been nice earth, to see that before I came on. Which is could... Jill Jones. Um, everyone should know how much I love Jill Jones. I think Jill Jones contributed so much um, to Princess Music. And in my opinion, she doesn't get the props that she deserves. Everybody in the know knows that Jill basically was everybody in the Prince camp. So when you think people are singing, it's really Jill. <laughs> I just, I have to say thank you, Jill. Um, you. You gave so much to us, and we continue to li listen to all of this music to this day. Like the Jake yeah. Lewis record is yeah. probably yeah. of service. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get started with our keynote, and Alexandra, who is my co-producer of the event, is going to join us on stage. And everyone should know who Jill Jones is. Everyone should know who Andre Simone is. So we're not going to do formal introductions. Started, and we're going to talk about Minneapolis for a minute, particularly with what's going on. And I know you touched a little bit upon it um, in the previous um, panel that we had, but I think the way I would like to start the conversation is talking about the unrest that's going on in Minneapolis today with George Floyd and everything that's going on there with the Black Lives Matter movement, but also how do you compare that to when you were growing up in Minneapolis? And do, do you see, like, are you surprised by what happened? Um, were things different or were they the same back then? So that's the question to Andre. And then to Jill, I want to ask, what was it like moving from California to Minneapolis um, and what that transition was like? So Andre, if you don't mind. The yeah, not at all. Um, you know, honestly, it really hasn't changed. You know, in 1968, there was a riot. Um, you know, basically, it was after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, they burnt down uh, Plymouth Avenue, all the different stores and shops up and down. There was like movie theaters, torched them all, you know. And uh, one of the things, um, and the same thing then, you know, was said, you know, that they say now is like, why do, you know, why do, uh, why are they burning down their own neighborhood and why they're burning down their whole, their own community. Yeah. And, and what I said earlier is the same thing. And it was then as it is now, it's like, I think, you know, it is, it's, it's kind of hard to put it sometimes, but you know, black folks so often, you know, didn't have something, you know, didn't have their own establishments, you know what I mean? Their own buildings, their own edifices, their own structures. <clears throat> and I think it's really important to actually have your own structures, you know, things that were built by you, for you, mm -hmm. and, you know, specifically, you know, not some hand-me-down structure, oh, well, we're going to, you know, we'll have the, you know, the housing authority make you a little community center over here. And they, they really, you know, I mean, in, 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 a, in a way, it's, it's really, how do you rip the heart out of a thriving community 101 was what they did in Minneapolis because they, they took you know, the community center that we, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for that community center, the way Spike Moss and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. wouldn't have been no me, wouldn't have been no Prince, there wouldn't have been mm -hmm. no time and Jimmy Jam and all of that. So, you know, so it's like, and, and what they did, and it's really, it's just, it's, 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 it's pathetic, it's pitiful. And it makes me angry when I think about it is because they took the community center that was the heartbeat of that whole area. They took it out and you know what they replaced it with? A police station. <laughs> a police station. They ripped out the community center that was the bloodline of all of this creativity and all of this, you know, mm -hmm. um, action and create, you know, all the things that people were doing. They took it out and put a police station there. And then the police ran around killing people. And, you know, and then they, you know, I mean, where did the drugs come from? It ain't like, I mean, I was right there. Trust me. I knew everything that was going on. Right. You know, I knew where everything was coming from. I knew they were coming from people were coming from out of state. All of a sudden they'd have all this money and drugs and guns and it was just, it was, it was purposely done to create this atmosphere of, of, of you know, um, basically trying to cast black folks in a, in a, in a, a position 
to the point where they had to really, you know, defend themselves. You know, they had to, you know, obviously opportunities were already systematically and, and institutionally taken away, you know, and they were very hard to get. And then, you know, you can get into the whole, you know, the breakdown of the, the black family because, you know, what they did was they lured a lot of people in with, you mm -hmm. know, with welfare checks and stuff like that. And, and they said, listen, you know, you get a welfare check, but you can't have no husband, but you got to have right. kids. Right. But you can get this, you can get this apartment over here and they made it appealing to move you into a community, but you can't have no husband. You can't, you know, you got to have at least two or three kids. It's like, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, and growing up, because I saw it because it was, a, it was a conversation. It was like, my mom, mom would talk about it all the time. And my mom, part of her whole thing was, you know, she ran a community center, um, the Y, mm -hmm. and, and had programs for, you know, uh, teen pregnancy programs and all that kind of stuff. So she was, you know, I mean, she was, you know, helping everybody and doing everything. And our family were, were very keyed in. And that, I think that's why, you know, I think, um, you know, all of us were contributing one way or another. But it really hadn't changed much. And then when Joy, George Floyd was murdered, obviously, it opened up you know, everybody's eyes, the world's eyes, to understand what everybody else, you know, from the black community always knew. It's like, they're out here thinking this is some sort of Grand Theft Auto show, you know, or mm -hmm. video. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, mm -hmm. they got this TV show and they got their little TV theme and they got their dark sunglasses and they're pretending to be gangs and they don't know anybody in the community. And they're just murdering people because they don't know how to have a conversation. You know, and it's like dominance, you know, of, of a culture over another culture needs to stop. It shouldn't be happening at all. Mm -hmm. And what they, it needs, it just needs to stop, you know, because it's like, how are you going to, you know, how's somebody going to come up to you as a man and say, you know, let me see you this with an attitude. You know, the first thing you're going to say, man, first of all, you don't step to me like that. Right. That's the reaction you're just going to have. Yeah. Then you're going to have a problem. And then, then it becomes, you know, well, I ain't got to bow down to you. I don't know you. You don't know me. Don't talk, you know, then it turns into a whole nother thing. Cause I've had my run-ins, and I was saying earlier, I mean, you know, my brother had run-ins, mm -hmm. uh, serious, vicious run-ins, kicked the police car window out. And, and my nephew is, is, I was saying, he's in a wheelchair, literally. The police broke his back, um, hit him and, you know, beat him in his head. And it, basically, I can't see out of his eye. I mean, he's younger than I am. And it's like, it's just, it's just, a, you know, my other brother, it, you know, went to prison. And, you know, it's like, I think they set him up. I mean, I, you know, you'll never know because how are you ever going to find out? It's just, there's just so many, it's just been going on. So to say it's changed, no, it's not changed. It's the same thing, different day. And it's just, it has to stop. And we have an opportunity right now to do something about it. But it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be up to us to, to change the narrative of all of this. Because we have too long allowed people to, you know, hijack our narrative, to tell our stories, to, you know, to basically, you know, I opened it up by saying, you know, you tell a lie. You say, how does that, how does that saying go, Julie? You know, uh, um, you tell the truth. God, what is it? Um, when you, you tell, tell the, the truth, truth, it becomes part of your past. And when you tell a lie, mm -hmm. it becomes part of your future. Mm -hmm. It's the same yeah. thing. It's like when they've been lying. They've been lying in the history books. <laughs> they've been lying mm -hmm. all along. And you can't lie anymore because, you know, one of the things that I think George Floyd did was open up the eyes of so many people. You know, and, and, and it's going to take everybody. So, you know, thinking somehow or another, it's just going to be an all black revolution. No, it's got to be a worldwide. And, and that's what that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. And the only way it's going to be um, it's going to end in positivity is everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's, everybody uh, has to understand that we are actually all in this thing together. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide what kind of world you want to live in. You know, what kind of future you want for your kids, because we're not going anywhere. Right. Blacks are not going to where Hispanics right. are going. Anywhere. Nobody's going anywhere. So it's better to just figure this stuff out now. Here we are now. We're at the table, seated at the table. Let's figure it out. What, uh, like, the, like the Panthers had a 10-point plan. You need to come up with a 10-point, 20-point plan, whatever it is. But you got to know what you want so mm -hmm. you can get what you want, so you can get what you need. You know, right. but you got to start there. And I think it starts with looking, looking in the mirror and deciding what, you know, maybe what, what does black culture look like in 30, 40 years? You know, I mean, because, you know, you know, we can't do the same thing either. We got to change the page. So it ain't just the onus isn't just on any. It's just it's always been on us and it's still on us. The kind of movies we make, you know, I was talking earlier about, you know, the kind of plays we do. It's like mm -hmm. if, if we did, because one of the last times me and Prince spoke, we talked about building a community center. And I thought it'd be great to have like a playhouse where you could have plays and, you know, and concerts and stuff like that. But the reality is, you know, what kind of plays are you going to going to do? You know, you can't, you know. 
trying to get young young kids inspired by Shakespeare is great, but we need to write right. new plays. You know, plays that come from a perspective because black culture is so beautiful and so vast. I mean, Duke Ellington. I mean, uh, Cab Calloway. I mean, the list goes on. Lena Horne. The list goes on and on of all the diversity of storytelling that you can tell. And it doesn't have to be inventors. I mean, my uncle was in, my dad was an inventor. Mm -hmm. My uncle was a war photographer. There's just stories upon stories upon stories that you can tell that they don't always have to go into boats and beat downs and, and you know, and slaves right. and, you know, and, and it, it's, it's gotta, we gotta move past that and start telling stories that just fantasy, you know, or reality. Or, you know, or just, you know, I mean, the stuff that I've been through, the stuff that Prince has been through, the stuff that, you know, that Jill's been through, the stuff that y'all mm -hmm. been through. We, I mean, we all have- you know, Everybody's history, got a story, right? You know, and everybody always gets hung up on one little thing here, one little thing. It's just too diverse for that. There's too many things and too many, you know, I mean, and I always think about, you know, um, Barry Gordy, man. I mean, that brother, the movies were amazing. They were like, I mean, to this day, you know, Lady Sings the Blues, Mahogany. Mahogany, right. Just Long the presentation of Diana Ross. Just, the presentation yeah, of Billy Dee Williams. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just, we got it. We, we, we have such a rich history and mm -hmm. so much that we can contribute and that we should be contributing. And we are contributing. And don't get me wrong, because a lot of people are doing a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, but, but you know, we, we just have to get and create platforms, you know, where we can really kind of broaden our mm -hmm. horizons and, you know what I mean? Because even in the music industry is is such a, it's such an interesting thing. Because they 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 I don't even want to. It's it's hard to even get into it. Because if people really understand how it works, people would not be patronizing some of these platforms. Because mm -hmm. yeah. they're just killing artists. I mean, the 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 idea of an artist. I mean, because you ever wonder why are artists always? Why is it always about young artists? Like for somehow or another, when you turn 30 or 40, somebody you just lost your way and you're some, somewhere sucking your thumb wet in the bed. No. Well, there's something to be said <laughs> about like, young and dumb, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, because you're mm -hmm. naive mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're hungry. And you, you know, you want the goal. You want to get you want to get here. And there's someone yeah, here, a benefactor that, that can seemingly get you here. And right. um, I mean, a lot of the things that you brought up, particularly about, you know, presentation, um, you know, um, I mean, you touched on giving back, but a lot of this too is the idea of pooling resources together to build something out of seemingly nothing. And that's what it should be. I think, you know, I mean, if it were me, if I were, if somebody said, Andre, we want you to run for, you know, uh, <laughs> the neighborhood sure. knucklehead. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I want you to put all this stuff together. I would, I would say, listen, NBA, NFL, entertainers, contract. Y'all need to y'all need to pony up, mm -hmm. you know, and it needs to go toward, you know, um, the communities all around the country, because it's like, you know, there's no need that that should have been should have been done. And it's just something that, you know, we can do. And then with that kind of power, there's just no there's no stopping what you can do from from there, because, you know, the reality is we're just people are still in the mindset that somehow or another we don't have power. We have Immense, immense power. enormous, right. ex extreme. We have so much power that we really have to, we have to really kind of ring the bell and use it. You know, otherwise, you know, you don't use it, you lose mm -hmm. it. And it's like, look, there's just so many things. So I don't want to rattle on. No, so but just, I mean, gonna... it, it, a lot of what you're saying, you know, it, 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 it's kind of the, I mean, I know for me, you know, it is special that mm -hmm. not just that I'm, uh, I'm talking to you, but that I'm talking to both of you together because mm -hmm. what you, you know, what you represent, I mean, I, yeah, I've been a fan. D'Angelo has been a fan since we were, you know, effectively children, Yeah, Ting. you know, wow. yeah. <laughs> and, and you make me feel so young. <laughs> you, know you make me feel so young. Right. I should call our daughter in here, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, and and the and the images and the music that you all wrote, performed, contributed to. Um, you know, there's there's there there's some of us in this in this really large global Prince community that see it as, you know, Prince being I, I like to call it, you know, Prince in all capital letters. And to me, that that is that envelops everything. That envelops, 
um, you know, you recording Dirty Mind with them in the house on a 16 track. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily understand the significance of that as, you know, a 12 year old, as a 14 year old, mm -hmm. you know, but once I had some life experiences behind me, I saw the significance of that, that we, mm -hmm. we, we got an opportunity, let's buy some equipment, let's make this album and let's make, you know what I mean? And let's do it the way that we want to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, Let's let's meet. I'm being kind of silly and facetious, but you know, let's meet Jill Jones and bring a voice, <laughs> you know, to this and begin to build yeah. a sound, you know, yeah. and then that represents something. So, so with with um, both of you, you know, early, um, and, and I like to. I'm on this kick now where I'm telling that every time, I, anytime I have an opportunity, I said, okay, tell me this. Imagine a world before Purple Rain. Imagine a world before the zeitgeist, you know, mm -hmm. and that that can help us define the makings of Prince as an artist and the people that were around him and the people that were working with him, you know, um, because it really provides a, um, a foundation for inspiration. Like they did, yeah. I could do it too. What it meant Definitely. to me, I can take that, you know, and create something that means something to, you know, someone else. Um, but it's easy as, as uh, you know, someone like me or somebody like D'Angelo or many fans, you know, that are on the outside looking in. Um, and time tends to stop for us, you know. Um, for some people, Jill Jones will forever be the platinum blonde who was the waitress. Yeah. But that's 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 not her story, you know. Um, mm -hmm, no. You know, for Andre Simone, you know, the the narrative may stop after, um, you know, uh, Jody Watley's career, you know, or for some after Surviving wow. the Eighties <laughs> or AC. But that, right. but there, you know, but there's so much there's so much more to that, you know. And so a, a lot of events like this, you know, we try to humanize not just Prince as a person, but all of the aspects of mm -hmm. what made this music so important and 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 you know why this music is special so you know i i think it's important to do that um on so many levels because you know jill is a career and is an artist in her own right and i think you you do do you do prince a disservice and you do everybody a disservice if you really don't give you know the people who actually you know um he was around and was around him because it wasn't like, you know, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself. It wasn't like I was waiting around for him to come and shake me into anything. Mm -hmm, you know I mean? Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times I tell people, listen, you know, we met, you know, I didn't meet him and say, Oh, I want to go live with him. He met me and wanted to come live with me and my family. Right. So all the things that people think about Prince and all that different stuff. Well, if you know, all of that stuff, why did he come and want to live with this dude? You know? So it's like, so I must've been bringing something to the table, even though to be honest with you, i I was just how I was. I mean, I was, I didn't think I was going to live past 21. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every moment of my life was spent like, you know, with desperation, like we got to do this, we got to do that. We got to look, we got to, you know? And so, I mean, that was just my attitude, you know? And I just think that so many people I know, and it's, and, I mean, it's, and I'm not saying for everybody because everybody was not, you know, like I was, everybody did, wasn't, didn't have a relationship with Prince that I had. Mm -hmm. Everybody says that they had these relationships and those relationships and blah, 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 blah. But the reality is what the reality is. I know what Jill's relationship was. Jill shared a story with me that I thought nobody knew except me and Prince. <laughs> and I was going to leave it that way. And then, you know, and then she told me, and when she told me that, I realized they must have been extremely close. <laughs> it, was, it was like, he told, I said, she told me that. I said, he told you that? And I was, where, I was literally was like, where is he? <laughs> it was like, but yeah, I was like, that, and then I realized, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I you know, because he would, uh, I, I guess, from what I'm hearing, is he got a kick out of telling people some of the goofy stories and the things that I would, because I, I, I was, yeah. you know, I was, I, I came from, you know, I came from a different, uh, different side of railroad tracks. And I was definitely, like you were talking about, I was, you know, uh, I was that kid. Nobody wanted their parents hanging around with me. And I really can't blame them. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think he so spoke he a lot about you because he was reminiscing a little bit or in a really weird way, it was sort of nostalgic. So he mm -hmm. 
who else was going to listen to those stories? I would listen, yeah. you know, it was, yeah. it was, they were funny and I could relate also because I think because of um, similar backgrounds, similar, having similar parents or family members who were, you know, kind of sheltered you a little bit. Cause as I've mm -hmm. told you, Andre, I think Prince was kind of like a sheltered boy, mm -hmm. you know, he was a sheltered kid on the block as much as he wanted to, I think say he was a, you know, out in the streets. He really wasn't. You could know from no. him. <laughs> he sort of no. learned that when he, you know, his life sort of began at your house as far as, uh -huh. you know, what he started to, the wheels started going. So, and I, I feel like in Minneapolis at that time, what's so important to always remember is because it still is in the state of what it always has been. Right. I think that it's important to really focus on the fact that you know, these young kids from over north or even people, black people, were actually making some strides and there's always somebody to come along and just pound you down. And I, I feel that maybe Prince wanted to stay there sometimes because it was sort of empowering to once you start making a little money and you come back mm -hmm. there into town yes. and mm -hmm. we all had nice cars and, you know, and mm -hmm. I will say the police stopped us incessantly mm. once the cars started coming into it or mm -hmm. once mm -hmm. you gave your car to somebody else or once you were just walking down the street it, it was just and that was pure jealousy but yeah we're jealous of us going into restaurants and it, it was so palpable you you could really you knew it was there but it mm -hmm. felt really freaking good yeah i was gonna to say just, yeah, it had to feel good that you were on yeah, top of the world, like literally. And, and so I think somewhere along the way, I don't know if law enforcement or the mayors or the people got together and said, "We can't let this happen again." Mm -hmm. As much as they try to say they were so happy that all of the yeah. success came from Minnesota, I'm not a hundred percent sure because they made sure to take taxes. Mm -hmm. They made sure, but, but the city itself, as a town, didn't really give back anything to yeah. the black kids in the community. Yeah, so. It's like I mean, I'm happy to have been a part of that, of moving it along and just sort of dyeing my hair blonde and knowing I'm secretly black. You know, it was yeah. like Prince mm -hmm. had the best pick out of it mm -hmm. because yeah. it was really taking, going over to the Loon Cafe. They'd make fun of us or <laughs> how we were dressed. And, and then it would be like, you know, and Prince would sometimes just like take out a wad of money and be like, you got this? How yeah, much you got? Like, mm -hmm. I remember uh -huh. doing stuff like that. Yeah, and then driving off in the BMW, but it was important yeah. to go through that. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, it really was a great time. I mean, you know, when I think about it, because yeah. um, even when I lived there, but I, I just, I couldn't, and I understand because you're, you're, you're spot on, because in Minnesota, you could, you know, at that point, you were rock stars. We were you, rock stars. You could, you could floss. Yeah, you know, it's just the way it was. <laughs> And it was before it was before Jimmy Terry uh -huh. and, uh -huh. uh -huh. and uh -huh. Jerome and, and and it was before any of that all of that. So it was just me and Prince. You know, I mean, so we were like riding around back to our old neighborhoods and literally, I mean, we were like we we ran, we were running the town for a mile. And for a while it was great. But you're right, it just got, you know, and I don't have the patience for police. And I don't have they kept stopping me mm -hmm. and you know, because I I think I had a Corvette at that point. And they kept mm -hmm. stopping me and I was just and one time I was, and because I'm, I can be kind of silly, but I was like, I was like, well, they ain't stopping me because they had stopped me and they said if they catch me again, you know, I was going to take my license away. So I figured I'm going to give them a run for their money. And I'll never forget, I was blazing down, I think, Highway 12. I was going like 140 or something like that, something insane. And I remember looking at the, there was a girl in the car with me, just her eyes were, <laughs> it's like, and yeah. they didn't catch me. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't catch me. I lost them, you know, but they eventually got me, I have to say. And then they they they, they got me um, and it was a whole nother time. It was like and then they said that I pointed a gun at somebody and, you know. Yeah. And anyway, so then they pulled and, you know, checked the car and they didn't find no gun because it was back in the headrest. But, you know, anyway, it was just uh, it was crazy <laughs> times back then. But I had to get out of there. It was too, for me, it was too small. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, I think you're right because I think for him, he felt comfortable because it's kind of, people got to know him and he got to carve out a lifestyle for himself that was where he wanted to be, you know? Um, 
Okay. And he did. It, was just, and it didn't work. I wasn't that kind of thing for me. I was just. The What's movie. really interesting to me is that I listened to the Dirty Mind record, mm -hmm. and when you listen to the lyrics, and you there's this sort of utopian uh, kind of uh, society that he creates mm, in yeah, the yeah. album. And so, yeah, I go there, and and to a degree, but but that's also a musician's life. We mm -hmm. tend to have all sorts of races intermingling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but Minneapolis as a whole, those worlds don't really mix. The bankers are not all up in your no. So it was, but what was interesting was that the vibration that started to come from over north, because all the girls like them yeah. and started pulling that yeah. sort of messaging happened. Yeah. It's weird. What happened is it did manifest a movement, but I think the powers that be in Minnesota were afraid of it and they have to suppress mm -hmm. because that was a manifestation. And I think it's in any kind of art form. We all create this utopia. Mm -hmm. We just do. You're mm -hmm. an artist if you're creating. You know, if you're not going down the utopian road. I don't think you're an artist. I think you're a disruptor. Yeah. I just don't think your work is, I just don't think you really have any value at this point in life. I mean, like I think, that, I think that our world has been shifting on a dime for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of stops and starts, but what's so amazing about the Black Lives Matter thing, mm -hmm. the movement, and this time all races becoming on, involved, perhaps it is gonna be what Martin Luther King said, love, gets rid of darkness, light mm -hmm. and darkness. Yeah. And actually people are here for the right reasons, the good of the good. And and I do think that that can dispel. And I think we tried and tried and tried many times. But this time, if you're not on that ship, I really do think you're going to go, you're going to get left behind because yeah. I think there's more resistance mm -hmm. yeah. when it's changing you yeah. know when you're whipping something out and it really gets going that's where we are yeah, we yeah. just have to make sure we pull it the hell out that's yeah. that is we got to step up we got to step up and and you know and it's it's interesting because i think everybody has to lend their voice to this thing you know i mean everybody's got to get it get it get involved i mean i know you know i'm not new to you know part of the reason why i came back and started writing songs was after trayvon was was murdered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote a song about Trayvon and just tried to do whatever I could do with whatever platform people, you know, would, would come and listen to hear what I had to say. And, you know, I was like, and all the proceeds went to his family and, and mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then, then I was like, well, you know what, we need to get involved with poly, you know, the political change and laws and, and, and voting. And so I wrote a song about that. I was like, you know, we got to get po people out. If you don't vote, you don't, you don't count. If you don't count, you can't complain. <laughs> You know, but you right. said it yourself. I mean, that was that yeah. was always in your blood because because the influence of your mother as as a was, as yeah. running a community center, and even even um, um, Prince being the 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 serial philanthropist throughout his mm -hmm. career. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember I remember being publicized about um, the money that he was giving to Marva Collins, the educator in Chicago. Yeah. And I mean, now we're talking about. 81, 82, 83. So mm -hmm. these cycles, you know, are still happening. Was there that same kind of influence growing up with you in, you know, uh, living with you in your mom's house of that giving back of that philanthropy of that, of that, of that community spirit that maybe later led him to build these worlds like Uptown and Paisley Park and this environment that, you know, he would, he would effectively invite, invite his fan base into? That was, that was a I think question, so. Right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you had me for a second. I was like, I know what you're talking about now. And then you kind of, yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I think, I think, because back then, if you're talking about early, we didn't have any money. So right, right, it wasn't right, like right. we could build anything, but what we could do is we could get involved. You know, okay, I mean, okay, okay. You know, little thing that people don't know is me and Prince used to work a summer job. Um, but, you know, and, Prince and, Prince. you know, I mean, we we had to give back. We had to build yeah, stuff. Yeah, we had to yeah. bury stuff like old cars and stuff like that. I mean, it was a lot of stuff that we had to do. My mom made us do this. She made us sign up for these little NY mm -hmm, mm -hmm, neighborhood mm -hmm. youth corps jobs. Um, and so we had, you know, I mean, but but we also, I know, I, for me, I can't speak for him, but for me, I was like poor people's marches. I was going out to uh, prisons and, and talking to people. And as soon as I had a platform, you know, Spike would catch me. 
because he would always find out I was in town because my mom was on the board of directors at KMOJ. So I couldn't sneak into town. That's how Prince mm-hmm. usually would find out I was in town because my mom would say, yeah. oh, my son's in town. So they would announce it mm-hmm. on the radio. So then anybody, if I was trying to sneak in under the radar, which is usually the case, I'd be like, oh, Andres. And so they would come to my mom's house and, and then Spike would come and get me. You come with me. And he would take me, you know, and, uh, and he'd make me go out to the prisons and we'd drive out to wherever, Stillwater, or, you know, and, uh, and I was happy to do it. Cause, but, you know, cause that's what I, that's how our family was. And that's how we were in the community. Cause you know, the thing is, I mean, we, you know, we, um, we, uh, I guess were, were, um, I guess one or however you say it, an, an anointed family of the year in 1976 or something like that. Yeah. It's because everybody was like, um, you know, obviously my, my, my brother at that point was like, he, he had been through some crazy stuff, you know, crazy lifestyle changes. And I'm not even going to get into what he was, some of the things that he was doing, but you know, you back then you had to do what you had to do, but he had turned it around and he became a private investigator. Uh, my sister, Sylvia, the one who made, you know, a lot of the purple rain stuff and the clothes and all that and the vanity stuff and some of my, you know, crazy space suits and stuff. Um, she was a, the seamstress. My other sister was a model. That's how Al Bulio came into the whole uh, picture. Um, you know, it's just, you know, we all, you know, um, came, you know, obviously it was Prince and then, you know, and we all came with different things. And at that point, you know, our band was really hot. So, okay. you know, so they, you know, they were like, and my mom was 15 years old or something like that. She, I think she was married at 14 or 15, had her first mm-hmm. kid. Mm-hmm. So she turned around and went back to school and got a degree and, and, I mean, she had a, a community center named after her. So she actually came from, you know, went from being, you know, um, you know, working in white folks' houses, basically to help the movie. That was my mom's life, you know, and, and to where, you know, she turned it all around. So we, we were definitely hands on involved in stuff. And my mom got us involved in these things. So it was definitely right. in our psyche to come back and do whatever we could. If you can't, you know, and she would say, if you ain't got no money, then go, you know, go help, you know, um, uh, Miss Samuels, Liz Samuels mm-hmm. was in the neighborhood. She's got stuff for you guys to do. There was people in the community. It's just, you know, I mean, our whole thing was really a community um, uh, mm-hmm. uh, organized basis. You know, if it wasn't for the community, again, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how things would happen because we were very, very much a product of our oh, community. Thank you for that, Andre. Um, and I want to say your mom's name, which is Bernadette Anderson, for those of you not know, I think it's really important um, to recognize um, the, our, the women who do so much. And your mom was one of those women. And one of the questions in the chat, and this is actually something I would love to hear personally, so it really stood out to me. In Prince's unfinished memoir, uh, The Beautiful Ones, he kept talking about how he very much wanted to write about his mother, Maddie. And you never hear mm-hmm. anything, not much about his mom. So I was curious if you guys could share a favorite memory about Prince's mom, um, just because it was something that I've always wondered why no one talks about his mom, but I know that he loved her because, you know, like in one of the, his albums, I'm too tired to remember, he, he basically says, my patient mother, Maddie. So I know he loved her. So could you like share a memory? Okay. I'll start a little because I know Andre probably has a lot more. I didn't really see her very much. I mean, we saw her a few times. She pretty much mm-hmm. must have been that Scorpio pride being staying private. But there were many phases that he went through. Like at one point early on, he, you know, wanted to kind of put her in the category of a certain type of woman. I think I don't know. There was almost very edible in a very weird way, an unresolved conflict. Um, and I don't know if he was able to step outside. I heard that towards the end when she was very ill, there was, you know, he made some kind of peace, I hope so. Um, but then there was this really weird push-pull thing where then he would fly a sad first class and fly her coach. So it was like, it was just like, anything to, you know, she'd be pissed off when she got off the plane, you know, or I mean, and I, you know, so it was like, like, why would you want your night to go this way at your show? Mm-hmm. Why would you want that to be there? So I think they had some unresolved things. 
And I think for the most part, she kept her distance. Now she was with her sister a lot at the time. And I think they relied on each other and, you know, were, but I, I don't know if, I think sometimes Prince never let her off the hook sometimes. And I think she should have been. I think he stayed like a child in a perception of how he viewed her. Uh, because now that I'm a grown woman, I look at things and go, well, you know, maybe she needed to get remarried again. But those things seem to be always a topic, you know. And, um, yeah, but she was a nice enough woman, very attractive woman. But that's about all I know. You know, that kind of a way. It's almost like she tiptoed mm. around him mm -hmm. that time mm. in wow. front of other people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, obviously my uh, experience is a little different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. No, um, <laughs> no uh, well, the first thing I'll say, she didn't like me much, you know, and she didn't really want him hanging around me at all. Um, and so, you know, most of the things that I got from her was, you know, well, he can't come out, he can't come hang out and, you know, all of that for a long time. Um, and then I think obviously... You know, he and her had a thing because obviously she she married uh, Haywood, and yeah. um, obviously if anybody knows that dynamic between a stepdad when you got your real dad, it's in the picture. And I was really close with his real dad. His, my dad and his dad were friends, and they played in a band together. And so, so I got really close with his dad. So I, you know, I, I understood the dynamic, and I I don't know that he ever, you know, and I can't psychoanalyze the whole thing. I just know what he would tell me because I was I was always on the receiving end. Um, and it was just, you know, um, it was just, you know, I mean, because she really, and it, you know, and I have to say this because I think a lot of people just didn't understand what we were trying to do when we were kids and how focused and dedicated we, dedicated mm -hmm. we were to trying to become mm -hmm. successful. We were like, you know, I mean, you know, obviously it wound up being all about Prince, but in the, in the mm -hmm. early days, it wasn't that way. That wasn't the case at all. And it was very much a group effort. And, um, and I think once his mom in particular started to understand his dad as well, really, you know, it took his dad a minute, but once they started to realize, Oh, these guys are serious, you know, cause I, it took them coming mm -hmm. to a couple of our gigs, you know, cause I think they just thought we were just, you know, fooling around and thought that I was just some street brother that, you know, was going to get him in the, I, you know, did get him in a lot of trouble, but getting him into really serious trouble, you know? And so I think they were trying to keep that from happening, but, the reality was when they came to a couple of our gigs, they realized, you know, we, we did a talent show. They realized these guys are good. Wait a second. Okay. They're, yeah. You know, and then I think somebody must have, you know, reminded Prince's mom that, well, you know, that's Bernadette's son and Fred Anderson's Fred Anderson's son. Oh, wait, he's a musician. That's like, you know, because my dad was a venter and he's a, a, my dad is a, my dad's an interesting mm -hmm. dude, but that's a whole nother thing. But um, so I, I think, you know, all of that. And then Haywood's whole thing was interesting because Haywood, because you talk about the the airlines thing, because Haywood worked at the airlines. He worked. He was a sky cat. So there was always yeah. a weird thing about. Anyway, that was a you know this whole lot of stuff going on there that was pretty interesting. But a lot of dynamics. Yeah, a lot of so lot of crazy dynamics. It's interesting that yeah. you bring up the bands. I mean, at, at that time, the whole Midwestern funk band oriented style, like you know, from what like Dayton, Ohio, being like a hotbed of bands wow players man running all the way <laughs> up <laughs> and yeah. his brother catfish <laughs> going Say all what? the way up north um you know I, I always not just felt but between champagne and grand central you know prince was a you know a band oriented funk artist so it yeah. seemed like he would thrive in the band environment yeah when we were we were a funk cover band <laughs> you know, I mean, we played we literally played four hour sets you know, I mean, it was insane when you when I think about it in retrospect. Um, but yeah, no, we were a funk cover band, you know, um, and uh, we had a blast. I mean, it's like, you know, that's why when we were watching the, the video, it's really just a carryover from a lot of the stuff we used to do back then, it's, at least for he and I. I mean, the rest of the, the band came from, you know, dramatically different uh, backgrounds, you know, um, and, you know, and we really wanted to choose the band the band that we put together the way we wanted on purpose you know um because in a lot of ways because i you know originally thought morris should have been i don't know how many people know how amazing morris is on the drums we originally mm -hmm. thought morris mm -hmm. i originally thought morris would be should have been could have been the drummer but 
you know, um, there were there were other issues at work. That, uh, so, um, Andre, I think it's Pepe Willie um, who says that when you guys were young, he didn't know who was going to become more successful. That you and Prince were essentially neck and neck. And I actually would love to hear mm -hmm. because you're such a phenomenal bass player, and also Prince was too. Did you? How did you guys influence one another? How did you influence um, Prince's bass playing? How did he influence you in terms of musicianship? Well, you know, I mean, act, you just have to stop and think for a second. You know, um, you know, he didn't have no bass. <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. I was a bass mm -hmm. player. Um, my dad was a bass player. Um, I took it extremely serious. I basically showed him what I knew on bass. He basically showed me what I knew on guitar. In fact, one of the first times we sat down, he showed me something and he told me that his dad showed him. And it was, and what he showed me then was something that, I mean, I don't know what I would have done musically without that little bit of information. It was just mm -hmm. triads, how to go from triads. Mm -hmm. He's like, man, you gotta, sh you know, it was, we were just kids. I mean, we were, he was just saying, look, he, and he showed me this little piano thing. It was a trick on triads and how you go from one chord to another chord and you can do it in major and minor. And I was like, really? And he said, and you know, if you get stuck, just go to the next triad. And he was like, so proud of telling me this, you know? And, and I was like, and I was like, when I figured it out, I was like, this is amazing. And I didn't have, you know, at the time I didn't have no keyboard. I mean, my sister had like this little janky, that's how my sister became the keyboard player. Cause she had this little janky uh, uh, organ that, yes. yeah, it was like literally from Sears. Um, but, um, and that, so I would go home and practice on that. But anyway, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, I could see how he could say that, but I think the thing about Prince and the reason why I think he had, you know, definitely a head start on me in a lot of different ways is his father was a working musician. His father was a very serious musician. And his father um, literally would uh, teach us. He would just, you know, he would give us lectures on a regular basis. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, such a, I, you know, it's like, I, you know, I really can't say enough about his dad. Because my dad was a musician, mm -hmm. but he had stopped. He didn't want me to play music. He wanted me to mm -hmm. get into, mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, engineering and inventing. And my dad was actually into computers. Way back then, he worked at the first computer factory, this place called Control Data. Um, still, to this day, I have like this huge computer that he had back in the, I think it would have been the 70s, wow. maybe the early it's 70s. massive. Anyway, um, yeah, it's, yeah, no, it, it was, it is. It's, it's, um, wow. it's still down in his basement, but, but it's, it's crazy. But, um, but, you know, his dad was just such a, you know, Jill knows, you know, John L. was just in, in you know, I mean, I, I understood, you know, because sometimes, you know, fame and fortune and all of, all that 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 brings changes folks, you know, um, sometimes mm -hmm. for the good, sometimes not so much. But um, but I just know that, you know, John and, and you know, because I, you know, when I left, I would still go see John at his house over on, I think, Newton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just go visit and just, we'd talk and, you know, he'd be out there gardening and doing his thing. And, you know, he'd bring me in the house and he'd play the piano and just, you know, do what he would always do with us, you know, and it was, it was a beautiful thing. And, uh, and even when I think him and Prince had fallen out at some point, Prince was like, can you go talk to my dad? You know, cause I know he'll listen to you and, and, you know, and so, but the only problem is I couldn't find that house that they moved into where it was, I think it was in Chanhassen somewhere. I couldn't find it. Right. I literally yeah. could not. Kiowa. Huh? On Kiowa Trail, yeah, yeah I, where he was, yeah. I couldn't find it, and I was like, and then I tried to call Prince, and then I got some, I went through that maze of people that you got to call, and I was like, and so, yeah, I always felt bad about that, because. I mean, they fell out every now and then, and then John L. was the type who would just not answer the door, not answer the phone. Mm -hmm. If he was done for a minute, he was yeah. done. Uh, you'd have to go and leave stuff on the stoop or on his back door or whatever, but um, it must have been something for them to have really fallen out towards the end. Yeah. And I'm really thinking Prince was probably so used to it, I can't speak for this, but maybe he thought this will blow over, and unfortunately, you know, you run out of time with some of those yeah, things. Yeah, no, it's, it's so like, true. It's so true. And, you know, I mean, and I think, you know, yeah. I mean, 
You know, I mean, Prince was he was he was a very complex individual um, and uh, trying to navigate, you know, when you really when you think about it, because, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, when you really think about coming from having nothing, you know, and mm -hmm. being sort of an ambiguous figure in a, in a family or ambiguous in a community or ambiguous in any kind of situation and to distinguish yourself to the point that he did and having the, the, the money and, and, you know, along with money comes a lot of people saying a lot of things about you. And before you know it, you're like this, you're not, you're this, this Goliath that, you know, you know, just, you know, people that you used to know are throwing pebbles trying to just get your attention, you know, your parents as well. And, you know, and you, 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 you have to stay grounded. I mean, if I could give anybody advice, stay humble, you know, always remember, cause you know, I mean, you're, you at some point, you know, you got to be grounded in people who really care about you because if people don't care about you, you know, they don't, they don't understand how they should always be there for you. Always, no matter what, no matter if you fall out, they should always be there for you. You should never be vulnerable ever. But what's so strange is I think he turned a lot of his relationships into transaction relations. They all became transactional. And when that happens, when you're a recording artist or whoever, it, it changes your dynamic in your own family and all this stuff when you're the one controlling the purse yeah. strings or you're the one in the band, you're all friends, but then you're writing the checks and you've got other people telling you you're paying this one too much. And then there's this one. It's a really big adjustment yeah. for anybody when they go into that because nine times out of 10 at the beginning of our bands, we always have friends mm -hmm. in it. Um, and then it's easier to actually hire people that you don't have that yeah. with, which you ultimately, create. you ultimately create these deeper bonds anyway. But it's really strange because I feel like a lot of the managers and people that he brought on, they start to play key roles into whether your relationships will be sustainable or not. And it's like, even with the philanthropy that he did do, you know, there was a lot of pushback about certain things because these were white people managing mm -hmm. him who didn't care about Marble Collins school, yeah, okay. who, who, who still, you yeah. know what I mean? It was yeah. not there idea was we want to get him in Rolling Stone. We want him to be this. So let's just X out everything black about him yeah. if we can, even to the women that he's seen with, even to all of it. And I think it took Prince down a road that may have not been, I mean, I, I think it was a lonely road. And maybe that's why he circumvented, got clean house and went back with like NPG right. and all that stuff. Because I mean, that I really think he went down a road that was, I mean, yes, he was in control, but then again, you start to attract. Yeah. Him. I mean, you know, when you you're paying people, when you're, it's always an interesting thing is when you're paying people in that capacity, you know, yeah. if you, if you start taking it too serious, you know, you start thinking that you own this person, you know what I mean? Like, I'm paying you and I own your life right now. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to pay. Yeah. And it was never, I didn't have that kind of relationship. Because first of all, I wasn't even, I didn't want to be paid. At the, I think from the, for the first tour or something like that, I just didn't want to be paid. I was like, you know, right. I, we had done gigs long enough where I wasn't getting paid. It's like, why am I going to have my friend pay me, you know, to, to do what I love to do? And then obviously it got to a point where I was like, right. okay, well, you know, I guess I should probably accept some money because I was still doing some yeah. of my little hides, my side hustles. Um, but, um, but, you know, it just got to a point where I was like, you know, I should probably, and then it, then, then I started seeing what you're talking about because then I realized some people were getting some money and it was really, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, to break it down, it seemed like black folks was always getting less money than white folks, you know, we were, we were yeah. getting the aid than the it white was always, and yeah, fans. And, and it a was lot always of people under kinda, the misconception. Yeah, it was always, I, there were two camps mm -hmm. in, in, in Prince's community there were white people and then there were black people yeah. and it looked like maybe we were all going to really get along but you know and we did for the most part but the white people got paid more yeah. than us yeah it was you know i mean i had i had heard that and then when i when i had a conversation with one of the band members who told me what they were making and i was like wait a second yeah. mm -hmm. I i'm saw. like i'm i'm i've yeah. been along the whole way and i'm 
making half of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, how does that, well, uh, because, that ain't right? Anyway, but you know. Happened. Well, the managers come in and start picking people to join the band or whatever. They determine the value of it. Mm -hmm. They they know the difference between how somebody played their instrument because certain people, based upon their natural abilities on an instrument, maybe should have made less. But they based it upon a lot of uh, fraternization because uh, I don't know why this is, but even though we all commune together, the people of color fraternize more co comfortably with each other. And there were some white people who could hang, but for the most part, I was never invited to any of the white people's barbecues or get togethers, not wow. one of them, not mm, one, that's... not one. You know, maybe six hundred girls because we were all like the same age, uh -huh. and that was just, that was a natural situation. Those were teenagers, but when they all got together to talk about brands, I was never invited or whatever they did. Wow, that's never. a that's not one thing. Yeah. Well, it's odd to me, not necessarily that, but it's 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 just interesting that, and I'm getting into like the recording process because as prolific as he was, you know, recording. Andre, you recorded with him a lot. Mm -hmm. Jill, you recorded with him a whole lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, in my book, you were such the go-to that you were really his secret weapon. Um, that process with him doing it, was, was it, was it almost like a work schedule? Was it, was it, <laughs> I'm not oh. seeing your face. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> And I honestly don't know. We didn't have cell phones then. I'm like so thankful that we didn't. I probably, I mean, they were really seriously. Um, but then you get used to waking up in the middle of the night. And then he sort of became, there in all of his randomness, there was still, he was a creature of habit. There were things that he would do repetitively that uh -huh. would be, okay, he'll probably call at three o'clock tonight. Yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking about like, you know, band members and I mean, I'm going to stay, you know, non-specific, but I mean, band members, you know, in theory, I need you for a rehearsal and then I need you for a tour, which is the whole point of the rehearsal. But yeah, but when I'm wrong, I think a lot of change from what he was creating with the with Andre and everybody from before, because, you know, he was now the boss in charge. Mm -hmm. It was no one was his friend. So rehearsals to me always, and Des was there, who he could never really tell Des anything about his guitar playing, but he could about everybody else. And Matt, he couldn't really, you know, he was more challenged. He would ask things of Lisa because we knew exactly what he'd want, so he'd tell her. But yeah, for the most part, yeah, it was like he knew exactly what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He was refining them. Mm -hmm. He would tell because he was usually before rehearsal okay. practicing when they came in and he'd go hey and and how he did it was so great because they'd almost think they were jamming the song but he had already been playing like the keyboard line for a while with a drum machine and then they just start coming in and maybe picking up their sticks or whatever and then carry on with what he and then he'd go somewhere else mm -hmm. that so I actually want to dive a little bit deeper in the, into this because a lot of questions in the chat are about, um, Jill, how you recorded with Prince more specifically. How did you, like, how did your studio relationship start? And then once your studio relationship started, how were you brought in to do vocals? You know, did you um, have control over what you saw? Did, you know, was it a collaboration? Can you dive a little deeper about how you personally collaborated with Prince in the studio, but also how that all started? Who, me? Yes, Jill. Um, I guess it happened just sometimes being within proximity and being, uh, being there, or he would call and ask me to, you know, come and sing on a part. Um, but a lot of times, you know, I lived down the road. I was closest. But then specifically, I think there was just a tone quality. He and I were really good at blending. Yeah. Um, and I don't, yeah. I think Andre was excellent with blending with him too, because actually they, you sometimes couldn't, 
tell the difference on stage at all. It was really great. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have that. He didn't have that on song. Yeah, and it's and you hear that, especially when yeah. you, you hear that in the songs that you're singing. And I can, you know, you can tell. It's just it it cuts through. I remember watching them live them. together, and there was this real uh, hmm. symbiote, like they were almost like the inside out of each other. So it was just an, and it was just really weird. It was like looking at a mirror, but a you know very distorted <laughs> mirror from a distance. But we'd yeah. go in the studio. Yeah, no, that, you know, I got to, that was the beauty of, of doing so many, you know, just obviously uh -huh. being so close and doing so much work together. But, you know, I mean, you're right. She, she you, your voice is such a, um, it's hard to explain, but it does, it, it, it matches his so well, you know, and it's, it's, uh, cause, you know, Prince has a really deep voice, but he, he has a wide range, he did. you know, um, and, you know, and when he mm -hmm. sings in falsetto and goes mm -hmm. back and forth to have a female voice, to sort of balance that and counter that is just, you know, it's it's uh, it's a blessing. He was, you know, you know when when and I guess that goes to your question is when did he what what did you guys do that made you that first made that happen? Probably, right. I think it was from right. working with Tina Marie that made me so good at uh, uh, that. I'm, but I well, yeah. think, but also when we did Lady Cab Driver, we were sharing a mic at one point of the. Right. So you're really face to face okay. and you're watching and it's, I don't know, for me, I, anytime I did backing vocals with anybody, it was always like, we're a little unit and we need to sound like one person. That's how I was taught. Um, but yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe we both kind of have flat Midwestern sounding voices when we speak. <laughs> that are real yeah. yeah, no, it comes well, through. And I remember um, somebody I'm trying to think of who played that to me. Cause somebody played me lady cab drivers. People always used to think, you know, I had a problem with hearing right. Prince's music and they would always try to put us in this. Mm -hmm. And I just, it would always, it would always just surprise me. People would always go, I know you don't want to hear this, yeah. but you know, Prince has got this new song. I was like, yeah, I want right. to hear it, play it. And it was, I remember lady cab driver and I was like, right, like, yeah. like you're mad. Yeah. It's always like I was mad. <laughs> like I had some chip on my shoulder. It's like, no, 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 no. I, you know, I mean, if you think about it, why would I have a chip on my shoulder? I, you know, I, you know, managed to go off and do a lot of really cool stuff. But I mean, I think, yeah. you know, when I heard Lady Cab Driver, I was like, and I thought that was you, and I didn't right. know for sure, because I didn't right. know who else it could be. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, and I knew, I mean, and I used to hear you sing right. every night, I know. While, you know, because, and you had, and I remember, you know, you had such a voice then, because I would just watch, I would go, wow, because you guys were tight. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was just, you know, it was just, it was amazing. It was, it was fun to watch, yeah. definitely, uh, from our uh, perspective. Uh, you know, and we were, we were definitely sitting back there going, you know, you know, we were like, there's Jill. <laughs> it was like, no, not me. You. Yeah, you know, not me. Yeah, you know, not you. Know. <laughs> I'll shoot for Tina. Oh, there's certain things. <laughs> no, we used to, we used to be. Jill, were we there were, certain we were things silly. that you knew that you were? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> But yeah, no. See, sometimes, I mean, there's a part of this where it's like, I, you know, D'Angela asks a question or I'll ask a question and you all yeah. kind of, you know, start oh, talking sorry. amongst yourselves no, and I just want to just kick back and just, you know, no, no, don't apologize at all, you know, but um, thinking about um, trying to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. field a lot of the questions um, because, you know, as fans, uh, right. you know, we know all the songs, you know. We 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 know, or we think we do. You know, know the stories behind them, or what influenced this, or you know, is is right. is that Brenda or is that Jill? You know, is it Apollonia Six? Yeah, right. which it's, it's 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 that's Brenda, but that's definitely Jill. you know. But we when you were recording some of this material, songs, for example, like um, maybe um, 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 yeah. our destiny where Prince had a version with his vocal, you had a version with your vocal, Lisa Coleman, right. Lisa had a version with her vocal. Were they things where, because he could, he did, but he was deciding that what song version he had wanted to use. Or of like over a year and a half. Gonna... He played it for me before Purple Rain uh -huh. tour started, so he'd written it before. And then they took it um, to, then he, you know, I recorded it like a year later. Uh, I had heard it in like March, right before they went on 
something with the Purple Rain. And I only heard it with just an acoustic piano. So he wanted oh. that to be for Roadhouse Garden, his play. He wanted to do a musical. You know, is that? So Roadhouse yes, Garden. Yes, Roadhouse was Garden, to be and my I was supposed to be Electra. It, Electra was the name that just kept coming up a million times for him in everything about mm -hmm. what I was supposed mm -hmm. to play. Even Graffiti Bridge, I was my original part was named Electra. Not you. He tried that song, and then finally Carmen Electra now, came along, and I guess he finally got to do it. But it, you know, it was like Jesus. Uh -huh. He really had an attachment to this name. It's just this name. Yeah, it's like, okay, fine, let's a, do it. <laughs> I remembered at one point there was a play called Electra. It's by it's a, a Greek play, Electra, something Electra. Morning Becomes Electra was a movie, mm -hmm. and then there was another one. So, yeah, we toyed with that word a lot, the name. So, I, I, I hope that you haven't been asked this uh, millions of times, but a bright spot for me with the Graffiti Bridge movie, uh, D'Angelo and I sometimes have internal uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. debates over Graffiti Bridge as a whole. But seeing you on screen was really a bright spot for me. I mean, for two reasons, because I hadn't seen you in a, in a, in a, totally. in a while, which seemed like years. Um, and being such a fan mm -hmm. of your solo album. Right. I, mean, I love that album. Um, it made me feel like we we're about to get a, about we to get a follow up. <laughs> oh, we were not <laughs> getting Joe along Jones on the back. film. And, um, and I think that came from, you know, it, it was just well past its sell by date, the whole, you know, it took a long uh -huh. time for, for me to get the type of consideration for my projects. And by that time I was a lot older and I'd been traveling the world and it was great. Mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. want to go back Probably in, different. you know, like I hated wearing that garment that I had to dance in. I hate, it. and I'll talk about that more only because I wasn't really, I, I didn't really want to wear or how to dress. We never had that really too much before other than being on stage. Sometimes with lingerie, that was natural. But by this time I'd already been to Paris and I'd had really nice cashmere and nice clothes. I was like, I just want to wear some nice stuff by Azadine Elia and Jean Paul Gold. So, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, and then mm -hmm. he started trying to make clothes and then he wanted to do a video and we almost, but it was a song that we did in 1980 too. So a lot uh, of this was just like, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. and sometimes he would create these scenarios to do a video just to get me to fly to Minnesota. So when, when, um, when Graffiti Bridge started, it was supposed to be Kim Basinger was supposed to direct it. And I actually liked Kim. I met her. She and I were supposed to be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. two two people, like in the film. And then he changed. And when they broke up, obviously, he couldn't use any of the intellectual mm -hmm. property. None of it. He had to rewrite the whole thing. So I was a little bit like, what happened? Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of took this. You know, it was supposed to be more like Wings of Desire than Bender, and it isn't. Exactly. So one thing I want to do, because the time is flying by, and I don't want this time to go by without asking this question. Um, this question is for me. Um, so I don't know if everybody knows that you were on the Dirty Mind tour. I, everybody knows Andre was on the Dirty Mind tour, but I don't know if many people knew that yeah. you were on tour because you opened for Prince with Tina Marie, and I love Tina Marie, and I, I think she was an amazing musician and singer and so i really want you to talk about um what was it like being in tina marie's band i know that she also lived with you your mom was, was her manager can we talk a little mm -hmm. bit about tina marie and sort of juxtapose that with the dirty mind tour and that's when you first met prince right and then let the whole band yeah. go um yeah, working with Tina was, you know, she was coming into her own. We'd been on the Rick James tour. Then they, I think Nick Masters, the agent, put us on their tour towards the end. And so we piggybacked on top of Prince's thing. And 
you know, I think working in Tina's band was uh, a lot of rehearsal. Same kind of, I mean, people, same kind of intensity. Uh, except, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was the same type of intensity. It Tina lived in our house, so I was sure it was <clears throat> only the talk of discussion all the time, always. So it was kind of nice to meet up with these guys who were young, because everybody on the Rick James tour, although I loved them, they were like family to me as well. Um, meeting these guys was a little lot more interesting to me. You know, what? they weren't like, you know, I had nothing against people walking around in Parliament capes and all that kind of like moon chips and everything. But this was more <laughs> relatable. You know, I was like, ooh, okay. I'm curious, what did Tina think of Prince, particularly when you guys were doing the tour? And also, why did they never collaborate? I'm just, it, it seems like they really have know. a lot to say. They're both amazing. I don't think they actually hit it off with all due respect. I think she liked him, but he didn't gravitate that way. She was, Tina had, was, was a very, uh, she was a dominant personality. So if she likes a guy or, you know, whoever, she will make it known. And I don't think the Prince responded well if you were too, too aggressive. I think he liked the cat and mouse with some women. I, I don't, I think that was it. And I think Tina scared him, to be honest. He said she scared him. Okay. <laughs> but not, you know, not because she brought him a bunch of roses at the end of like that whole like dirty mind thing. And I don't think he was ready for Tina <laughs> because Tina, she didn't need a man to do anything for her. She didn't need him in the studio. She didn't need a man. She didn't. He, you know, was such a giving and loving person, but she was intense, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Andre, they were all, but she and uh, Mickey were all over you guys. Come on, why are you leaving me hanging like here? <laughs> Mickey, Mickey Free? No, Mickey, her, her background singer, they talked about oh, that. They that definitely, makes... I'd go to my room at the end of the night and, that we weren't always in the same hotel, but then occasionally, and it was like, yeah. oh boy, it's Andre out. And, well, and I go, yeah, like, no, were I, you talking to Andre tonight? And I was like, yeah. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's like a big brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, you know, it, you know, I think that from my perspective, and I think from Prince's at that point, we looked at Tina as sort mm. of Rick's sort of thing, you know, because. It was like this. We thought that you know, uh, if Rick was, if Rick hooked up with her, we don't want yeah. to have anything yeah. to do with her. Because <laughs> so, Rick already had so an think, issue with you guys. Know. Rick so already had issues with your band. Yeah, I know. I mean, we, I, I, you know, we, me and Rick, we had issues <laughs> just between me and Rick. So it wasn't wasn't so much with the band. It was really, yeah, you know, unfortunately, just me. yeah. Cause I just, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, he, he was, you know, he was, you know, he was a street brother and he would step to me in ways that you just don't step to somebody like me. And I'd let him know it, you know, and it was a couple of times where Prince had to just calm me down. Cause you know, um, I just wasn't having it. I don't care who it was. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm just, I've always been like, I'm still like that. It's probably, you know, part of my thing is I just don't, I, I don't, I'm, I don't, it's not that I don't play well with others because I can, <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but I just, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, um, you know, when people come with that whole, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to bow down to anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. And, you know, and I used to get in trouble because I, I, there was an issue that happened and I got blamed. I, you know, I mean, because after a while I just became a scapegoat, you know, because people knew that we had an just issue. just got blamed. Um, but uh, they, um, I don't know if you remember, there was a show out back then called Friday was it called Friday? Uh, remember the it was Saturday Night Live, and there was oh, yeah. with Mr. Bill yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. they were. Yeah, yeah. They, they had a thing on there, and they did a thing about Howdy Doody, yeah. and I actually um, uh, did a, um, you know, because I, you know, I can draw, draw and paint and all that kind of stuff. So I painted some uh, this goofy little painting on the on the um, on the chalkboard um, of Howdy Doody, right? And somebody went, came behind me, and put braids on it, and spray cologne on it, and. 
and uh, and um, and then it was it was in <laughs> Buffalo, which is Rick's hometown. Yeah. And you know, and then what what happened? We did it, it. It was in our dressing room, and I think one of the one of the uh, tech guys must have came back and and dressed it up and made it out to be Rick James. But you know, but because it was his hometown, he had like a bunch of people, the mayor and everything. So they they asked us because we were leaving. As as they could come in our dressing room, so they went in our dressing room, and obviously that's there, and it became you know, kind of a laughing thing, and and then they came and confronted me. I think Rick's brother came, is like, did you do you know blah blah yeah. you know, and stepped all up on me mm-hmm. like you know mm-hmm. like somehow or another I'm supposed to go no no I was like yeah I drew it <laughs> so what you know and he said he said well that was you know I said well no I said and I said wait a second I didn't draw I didn't put no braids right. on it you know and because I went to look at it I was like I didn't do all of that. I said, you know, because at first I was like, well, if you think he looks like Howdy yeah. Doody, you know, that's like, <laughs> that ain't, that's on you. But when I went in and I looked at it, I realized somebody had doctored it up after I left and it became a big thing. And then they wouldn't, you know, I tried to go to one of their after parties and they wouldn't let me in. And it just, we just had issues after that. Um, so anyway, but, but, you know, but the tour for the most part, and then later me and Rick wound up being really cool. Yeah. In fact, Tina, I ran into Rick and Tina mm-hmm. in Pasadena. Hey, that rhymes. Yeah. Rick and Tina, and pass it in. Anybody want some lyrics? There you go. But um, but yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was cool. It was cool running into him because you know Rick didn't recognize me at first, oh, right? Really? And I was like coming down. To, he say, didn't. What? No, he didn't. I was I came down Fair Oaks and I saw him. I was like, oh, there's Rick and Tina. I said, what's this? And I went and I just sat down because they were all sitting outside. You know, I just sat down and said, yeah, what, what you want, man? Oh, that looks good. And Rick was like. You know, you know, Rick is he's like all uptight, <laughs> right? And Tina said, Andre, said, Rick said, Andre, and he lifted up his son, like, Oh, Simone, man. It was like, Yeah, man. I said, I had you, didn't I? I said, I had you. I yeah. wish Tina had yeah. have done something with him. I wish, you know, I wish they would have tried, yeah. but you know, like I said, hmm. uh, that could be that she's just like intense, you know, and scared him. And he, you know, was like, Oh my god. You know, this is legit. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you have an artist like Tina, who, you know, like you said, they don't need anything. Wow. They don't want anything. They don't need mm-hmm. anything. So you have no leverage. No. You, you can't it try, to, exactly. you try to try to jujitsu your way into mm-hmm. something when somebody is just like, I don't, I don't. Exactly. Know you know, just, just come, come as you like, are. You know, like, you yeah. Know, yeah, come as you are. Like an artist and then listen yeah. to this artist thing. Otherwise, well, my you know, question for Dale, because I will, uh, from the audience from you, No Dash, is okay. um, about When Doves Cry and Prince removing the bass uh, from that song. Um, he has, do you know, Prince did that because he was trying to be petty to other bass players. He, he was trying to be petty. Mm-hmm. You no, know, he had a full mix of the whole song. And I, I think he muted something at one point and it and that's how he kind of heard it and then he sat yeah. there and listened and he was like I actually like this and I said I do too because it was very sparse and it did kind of like catch your ear and then he goes well so he did I think he did two different kind of versions and a few people didn't like the new one with you know everything muted but the- he just said and he did well, talk about this, that I said, apparently, I mean, I do vaguely remember saying, well, why don't you just do what you want to do? It's your song. You've already put out a movie. What yeah. more is your life? Yeah, you already put out <laughs> a movie. What more could you <laughs> What the hell, man? So, yeah, you, you, can quit, you can quit answering the people who don't really know what they're talking about. Yeah, and I think that it just, you know, it worked. Yeah, and I don't think he was okay. being petty at all. I, I Awesome. At all. So, but you know the one the one thing to Prince's credit that I will say and and it was a beautiful thing I thought always is he would seek advice from people that he trusted you know because mm. um, I know mm. that he mm-hmm. had an issue with um, when he was doing the Batman soundtrack and again you know um, I don't know if I was either working in Sunset Sound or if I just was driving okay. down the street and then this limo would pull yeah. up next to me Andre can you come to and it was that, you know, I'm telling you, that happened more often than it, it was actually got to be. I wish that happened to me. I'm just sitting out of light and Prince well, it wasn't, pulls up it wasn't, it wasn't Prince. It was usually some bodyguard. Or something. <laughs> he wasn't even in the car. Okay. And it would just, it would just be somebody. I mean, it was like, are they tailing me? Right. You know? And so I would, I went in and, and, uh, and he played me, you know, um, the, the stuff he was working on on Batman, I think in, in particular Scandalous. Mm-hmm. And he was asking me about the, um, the, uh, uh, 
the um, string arrangement because I guess they were giving a hard time about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and I was it was kind of the same thing. Look, you, you don't have to. You do what you feel. Yeah. You know, at this point, you know, it's not about what you know mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. It's like you do what you feel. It's not about me to come in and start saying no. You know, I mean, we used to do that back in the day, but at this point, you obviously have shown that you you got a command on your art. And so be the artist, you are Picasso, you know, so, so yeah, so. Mm -hmm. So we're coming on the end, I, I wanna be respectful okay. respectful of Jill's and Andre's time. They've given us so much today. So I really do wanna end on time. I don't want to continue, because Jill's coming back tomorrow anyway for the, for the Graffiti oh, yeah. Bridge commentary. I'm super excited Mary. about that. So to close, what I want to ask um, both of you, Jill and Andre, can you tell us like a favorite uh, favorite memory from the Dirty Mind tour? Mm -hmm. And if if that doesn't bring anything for you, what Andre? Can you talk about maybe a favorite song you like to perform on the tour, or maybe a song that you like to play from Dirty Mind now? Well, I have a favorite memory, but it, you know, um, <clears throat> might disappoint fans but it makes me extremely happy. Um, but the very last show of the Dirty Dirt, Mind Tour, my daughter was born. Um, we were doing a show in New Orleans and uh, that was the most amazing point in my life, period. So obviously that, was the, that would be the high point of that tour. And so Valencia, mm -hmm. if you hear me, mm -hmm. I love you. That was, that was <laughs> you know, I got a phone call. I was backstage doing the sound check and uh, I got a phone call, it was my mom and she said, she looks just like you. She's got your eyebrows. And I got these eyebrows. I got, you know, well, you can hardly see them, but I, you know, I mean, you kind of can't miss them. I got very thick eyebrows. My eyebrows always, my eyebrows always say I'm mad, whether I like it or not. Right? What a newborn. <laughs> they might as well say I'm mad and I'm angry and don't mess with me today. But yeah, no. And so she came out with the Thank you for sharing eyebrows. that, Andre. That's, you know? that's truly beautiful. Jill, what about you? Thank you. I have a, <clears throat> I have one from the tour. Um, somehow Prince got separated from you guys, from the rest of the guys and ended up in my car or I ended up in, in this station wagon going to, <clears throat> where would we be going to the show or what? I don't know where we- That sounds, that sounds really familiar. And in the car, you might've been there actually, maybe you were sitting in the front seat because I don't know how we and it was like a motel kind of hotel something weird hmm. and prince was trying to tell me i was just you know he could be very sarcastic and all of those guys were their sar sarcasm alert when they all came around everybody was sarcastic and you know about minneapolis at prince i'm like well where is that and he was like you don't know your geography and I was like, yeah, I know a geography. I guess it's just a state that doesn't count. So it was always a little barb and uh, things like that. And I remember that because I, I really think that, um, and, but the other really good one was going to the Boston house at, in Michigan. I was going to, I was going to say, I, that was really cool. And we went to Barry's, to the Barry Gold Mansion. Yeah. Bowling alley Bowling down alley. the basement. Yeah, that hmm. yeah. And then that swimming pool yeah. was amazing, man. It was, yeah. That house that was that blew my mind. That blew my mind. I got to tell you. Yeah, that, that was, was a good one too. I had fun that was with those guys. One. It was like eye opening for me musically. Um, I I just thought that the music that they all were headed, and of course to follow Andre's career. Andre and I actually stayed closer friends from that point on. Friends was sort of incidental mm -hmm. along the years, but Andre introduced me to a lot of people that you know became really important to me at certain times in my life, and. You know, we were we were good mates, you know, good friends. Always have been. Yeah, and, and you know, Jill's one of the few people I knew in California because <laughs> I still don't have very many, you know, uh, friends in California. I don't know that many people. And I've been living here forever, but I just, you know, just do what I do. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, we went out and had clams once, and it was the weirdest. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> clams look really strange. It's just like. And I was, yeah. you know, still very silly. We were silly young people. Uh, no. Now we're still we're still silly young. <laughs> yeah, people. right. Fused. True. Kicking and scratching. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jill and Andre. You have truly made today special. 
definitely for me and I know for Arthur and hopefully for everyone else. So thank you so much for being here with us. And I can't wait for the live commentary uh, from you, Jill, tomorrow.